Well, good morning, everybody. And today I am going to do a video that is very uncharacteristic for the channel and for me, but I think it could be helpful to some people um, to understand a little bit about trauma processing and to also understand a little bit about vicarious trauma. But uh, that being said, um, I'm going to walk you through kind of my experience yesterday and today in, in dealing with a traumatic event. So yesterday when I was doing my premiere, um, all of a sudden I heard this loud bang and I looked over and the neighbor's house was on fire. And, you know, we are a, not a super close knit community, but we, we're friends and uh, we're cordial to one another. And this is by no means meant to distract or um, minimize the extreme trauma that that family is going through. But I think it's important to recognize that everybody in the neighborhood um, was there to support them. Everybody in the neighborhood knew them, interacted with them. Um, cared about them and seeing them go through this, we were all just standing by for a, a large part of it, um, struck by the absolute horror of what was going on. Um, not only losing their house, but unfortunately they lost one of their pets. And I recognize that there is a, um, fine line that firefighters need to go through between, is it worth risking my life? Um, however, we were sort of horrified when they didn't even, they were notified that there were dogs in the house, um, barking at the window and they did nothing, um, because they didn't want to add oxygen to the fire to fuel it, um, which the fire was on a completely different floor at that point. But I digress. Um, they did not try to open the door to let the dogs out. Eventually, one of the neighbors did break a window and one of the dogs jumped out. The other one got scared. And we all knew that dog because we're a very animal centric community. We all knew that dog and, um, we all watched in horror because nobody was going to go in. None of the firefighters were even willing to try to open the door, spray some water and call them, try to call it out. And, and we knew that she was perishing and it was, it was horrifying. And some of you may not be as animal centric as we are. Um, and you may not quite get what it means to um, know that is going on with an animal. Um, but for a lot of us, animals are part of our family. So that really compounded the horror, losing all their stuff and seeing how fragile life is and seeing how fragile or how quickly something can change for you just in the blink of an eye, that was terrifying enough. But having to stand by watching in horror, um, knowing that Cassie was in there, uh, haunts a lot of us. And therein is where a lot of the trauma was. Now, um, my mother, when she was a young girl, her house burned down. My stepfather, when he was a young man, but long before he met my mother, um, his first family was killed in a fire. Uh, so fire, you know, I try to rationalize that fire is not that common. You know, look at all the millions of houses, how many actually catch on fire. We talk about that a lot in videos and we look at, you know, the same thing is true for plane crashes. They, you remember the plane crashes because they're horrific. Um, but you don't think about the thousands and thousands of airplanes that fly every single day that don't have a problem. And, and so I tried to remind myself of that yesterday, um, but it still, it brought up a lot of stuff and thinking about my mother losing her house made me think about my mother. And then I wanted to call my mother, um, 
to get support and, you know, whatever. And that brought up the fact that mom's not here anymore. She died very suddenly um, a couple of years ago, 2019. And um, so that kind of compounded every, actually it was 2020, uh, that kind of compounded everything that was going on. So my point in bringing that up is when you are experiencing a trauma, it can bring up traumatic memories. It can bring up distressful thoughts that are tangentially related. You know, my mother's death from cancer had nothing to do with a fire, but you see how my thought process went from her fire to her to, oh, hey, I ought to call mom because she'd be a support. And then, oh, crap, that support's not there anymore. So there was a lot to process with that. And, you know, in, in cognitive behavioral format, <laughs> um, I spent some time walking around in the, in the pasture. I let the chickens out, sat down with the donkey. Uh, while all this was going on, because it took them over six hours to put out the house the first time. They're back out here this morning. And um, I felt very guilty going out and leaving them. I felt guilty watching because there was nothing I could do. I felt guilty leaving and going about my, going back about my life like nothing was going on. Um, so obviously I didn't get back online yesterday and do any more videos or lives. But um, yeah, so dealing with that guilt, and it's not really survivor guilt, but it's kind of like survivor guilt and watching in horror when, um, a close friend, um, uh, when a neighbor is experience, experiencing something, you know, technically that does meet the criteria for that trauma according to the DSM five. So some people can find some validation in that if they want to, um, so then the rest of the night, you know, I knew that I had experienced a trauma. My husband was there with the neighbor trying to get the dogs out. So, and he's an animal lover too. And he knew that knowing Cassie was in the house was going to cause me distress. So that stressed him out too. So we were both traumatized in our own way. Um, I went about doing some of the things that I needed to do yesterday. At that point, I knew I was vulnerable. I knew I was exhausted. I knew I was not going to be overly productive. So I just kind of tried to keep moving. But the thoughts of the dog kept coming into my mind and they were horrible. They were, you know, horrible, intrusive thoughts and ruminations about what could have, should have, would have been done. And if onlys. And I know a lot of people struggle with that. And it's important to recognize that that's normal. For me yesterday, um, I had to engage in a lot of thought stopping and distress tolerance because using my energy to perseverate on that there, there's nothing I can do. I can't bring the dog back. Using my energy to perseverate on that, um, using my energy to perseverate on how badly that family is suffering right now is not a good use of my energy. That doesn't move me toward my rich and meaningful life. So it was important for me to figure out, okay, what can I do? I used some of that energy to write up what happened and try to get a appointment with the fire chief to see what was going on. And if there's anything um, that could be done differently next time, whether it's to uh, save an animal or maybe even save the structure, it took them more than 20 minutes to actually deploy water on this structure. Um, and, and we don't live in a super rural area. We've got a fire fire house that's four miles down the road and, um, fire hydrants across the street. 
Now you see by the fact that I'm talking a lot slower today and I'm having a hard time finding my words that I've got some brain fog. I am not having an A day today and, and that's okay. I need to give myself compassion for that. When I start thinking about and having intrusive thoughts, I engage in thought stopping. I say, no, that doesn't do any good to think about that. And I process it in my own way. Um, But it's not something that goes away. And so the exhaustion that I'm feeling today and the brain fog that I'm feeling today is sort of a culmination of all of those things. Am I more anxious about leaving the house now? Yeah, I am. Is that a rational fear? No, it's not. Absolutely nothing changed about our house. And however, because that incident was so close, um, it makes it feel that much more dangerous. It makes it feel that much more likely to happen. If it could happen to them, it could happen to us. Yes, that's true. But facts, context, and probability, uh, that's what I have to look at. And going back to how many houses are on this street, how many houses are in this neighborhood, how many houses in the 15 years we've lived here have caught on fire? One. So probability is really on my side and recognizing that we do everything we can to mitigate fire. You know, we don't overload circuits and blah, 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 blah. That helps too. Now I'm not saying that the neighbors did anything to cause this fire. Everything was off. Um, Our guess is that it was probably some freak occurrence um, that caused it to happen because they are very fastidious about turning things off. They don't burn candles. Um, and, and the homeowner had just recently, like 20 minutes before, left the house. Uh, she hadn't been cooking that day. I mean, there's all the things that you think could have happened. It hadn't happened. Um, So we're kind of chalking it up right now to a freak accident, which doesn't make a lot of people feel any better because that's even less controllable. But I have to recognize that some things are out of my control. There will be freak accidents. There will be lightning strikes. And um, I need to figure out, okay, what do I need to do now? Because I feel unsafe, whether you think it's rational or not, because like I said, nothing actually fundamentally changed about our house. But because I feel unsafe right now, because of that trauma, I feel unsafe and disempowered. How can I use that energy to feel safer? And one of the things that I did last night was look online about uh, new fire suppression type systems. And I got some feedback from some friends who are firefighters and I have firefighters or had, (laughs) they're dead now too, uh, firefighters in my family, um, and getting some feedback from them about, okay, what can I do since my, my creatures are part of my family? Um, is there something that I can do to keep them safer? And one of the things I'll share with y'all, um, cause I know a lot of you are animal lovers, um, They suggest having a room, ideally one that has a doggy door um, for dogs that goes out into into a fenced yard is the ideal situation. So when you leave, um, you can put them in that room. And if there is an emergency, they can go out via the doggy door. Now, that is not feasible for a lot of people if you live in an apartment or for some reason, you don't have a fenced yard. There are a lot of reasons. Um, So you need to figure out other things. And I'm not going to go deep into that right now because that's, you know, you can do your own research on what might be helpful. Uh, You can also consult with your local fire department. But what was important for me was, number one, 
recognizing all of the ancillary traumas that were brought up and thinking about imagining, and I didn't want to, but imagining that happening to my family, to my house, to my animals was devastating. And one of the uh, triage issues for people uh, who experience trauma is how close did it happen to your safe zone, your home? Well, this was next door. How similar were you to the victims? Well, we were pretty darn similar. Um, uh, what was the response, the supportive response that you got? And the support in this community was very strong for one another. Um, like I said, they were, we were all standing out there trying to figure out what we could do to help. And we're still working on that because obviously it just happened yesterday. Um, there are other factors but I'm trying to think, I can't think of them right now. I'll go over them in a more technical video later. Uh, so um, I'm sorry, again, um, my thoughts are not as cohesive as usual. Recognizing the trauma, recognizing the ancillary traumas that it brought up, like my mother's death and, you know, her experiences and Walter's experiences and then imagining my family going through it, which can be a natural event if you're very similar to and very proximal to what's going on. All of a sudden your safe zone is disrupted. Figuring out how to stay safe using distress tolerance skills to engage in thought stopping. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to have to come to terms with what happened. And I know it happens in other situations. And I know in other situations, there may be a loss of human life. And that is horrific and terrifying. Um, and those are all things that are just like right in my face right now. Um, that I'm going to have to deal with. When we, and, and that's not something that I may deal with today. I recognized when I got up today, used my mindfulness. I said, you know what? I am not having an A day today. I'm foggy headed. And I thought about not doing much today at all. Cause I had the videos, um, yesterday and the one for Friday already recorded. But then I thought to myself, well, this might be helpful to clinicians who are working with somebody who has experienced trauma, um, as well as, uh, to people who've experienced trauma to let you know that even if you don't experience it directly, even if it doesn't happen to you, it can feel like it's happening to you. Your brain automatically goes into that protective state and says, well, what if this happened to you? How can you protect yourself? It can bring up all kinds of traumas and it's exhausting. And it's important to be compassionate with yourself. It can also bring up a lot of guilt. Like I said, getting back to work today, just going on like nothing happened. Well, nothing did happen to me. And I do have energy. I'm reserving energy. So when there is the call to help, to pitch in, to do whatever needs to be done, I can do that. But right now there's nothing I can do for them. And I hate that. I hate fe feeling powerless when somebody else is suffering, but that's where we are right now. And I have to accept it is what it is. Um, and that's one of my sayings. It may frustrate a bunch of you. Um, and I guess there was really no ultimate point because this hasn't come to a conclusion yet, uh, but I did want to share with you how some of these skills that I talk about can be useful and why it's important to be aware of your stuff and acknowledge it. Don't say, well, that shouldn't be bothering me, or I already processed that. Well, yeah, you may have, but that wound got opened again, maybe just a little bit, but that wound got opened again and it's okay. It's okay to be tired. It's okay to feel whatever you're feeling, but it's important eventually to process it, have compassion with yourself 
and take it day by day, take it step by step. And if you feel you're not improving, um, in a reasonable amount of time, whatever that is for you, then definitely seek consultation with someone who might be able to help you process those traumas. Um, and, and this goes out to any of my neighbors, as well as anybody who's experienced this um, and watched it yesterday. Your trauma is real. And Anything I say in a video is not going to take away that hurt and take away that pain and that sense of horror. And it's something that will take time to deal with and come to acceptance with grieving the loss of a sense of safety and security is another task that I think we all are going to have to do. We're grieving for that family and we're grieving for our own sense of disruption in that, that our little bubble isn't safe anymore. So I guess that's that. Um, I've kind of rambled for quite a while. I hope this was helpful and I will see you in, um, uh, actually a live chat later today. So everybody have a great day. Um, I am going to do what I can today because today is not an A day, but uh, I am going to do what I can because sitting and dwelling on it, again, not going to move me toward my rich and meaningful life. Be safe.